Today I'm going to share with you 10 things that dog trainers absolutely hate. But before we start, a massive thank you and a round of applause for all of the support that we've been getting. Thank you so much. It's tremendously appreciated. If you've enjoyed a video, please make sure to leave a comment. Um, this lets us know what kind of content to do in the future. We're also on the verge of achieving a fantastic milestone for Dogs And, and that milestone is 100 subscribers. We're currently sitting on 88 subscribers, and I really hope we hit that 100 soon. To celebrate, when we hit our 100 subscribers, we are going to get a new plant. I hate that plant so much. <laughs> Please help me get a new plant. To make it a little bit more fun, our 100th subscriber and I'm gonna cut the rest of them out, but it's taken me about eight times to say 100th. Now I can say it easily. Our 100th subscriber is gonna have the privilege of naming our new plant when it gets here. Rest assured, this plant will live out its days in luxury, but just not feature in our videos anymore. To make this video a little bit more interesting, so you don't have to look at my talking head the whole time, I've got some footage of uh, me taking my dogs on a walk. We had a great time. Uh, Tux found some mud and managed to transform himself from a black and white Great Dane into a black Great Dane. Uh, needless to say, when we got back, it took me about an hour and a half to bath four Great Danes. So if you're wondering why there is random footage of dogs running around a field while I'm talking about something else, that's why. Right, all of the housekeeping's out of the way. Let's get on with today's video. Number one, top of the list, I'm sure for pretty much every dog trainer in the world, are laser pointers. Please don't use these with your dogs or your cats. Um, it's, it sets up a terribly maladaptive behavior pattern in the dog where it's constantly chasing this, this thing, but it never catches it. So the dog sort of ends up in this loop that's never ending. The dog then tends to transfer this onto things like shadow chasing or light chasing, and this can end up causing a massive problem and a disruption in the dog's life and the people that the dog shares its life with. So no laser pointers. There's a lot more functional ways of making sure that your dog gets exercise. Ideally, you always want to make sure that whatever behavior pattern you're motivating the dog to perform, so with the example of the laser pointer that would be chasing something, the dog can also close or consume the end of that behavior by getting to catch the ball. All behavior patterns have an appetitive and a consumatory phase, and what happens with the laser pointer is that appetitive phase just gets repeated over and over and over again, and it almost causes a short circuit in the dog's brain. Not giving the dog the consumatory phase of that behavior is incredibly harmful to the dog, so please no laser pointers. Hard treats. It's impossible for the dog to understand what the treat was a reward for if it takes the dog 30 seconds to eat the treat or to consume the treat. We need to make sure that we are very clear to the dog what they are being rewarded for and the best way to do this is by giving them a soft treat that they can eat quickly and it's easier for them to time the actual ingestion of the treat with whatever behavior it is that we're looking to reinforce or to increase in the future. So no hard treats because it takes the dog forever to eat them and it makes it very unclear to the dog what he actually did to deserve that treat. Long leads. I guess people think that they're being kind to their dog by giving them a long lead, which means that they, can, they have got a wider area to explore. And yeah, in theory, that sounds great. The problem with long leads, though, is that they literally get tangled up in everything. You, you're virtually giving the dog more rope to hang itself. Long leads are incredibly disruptive in an obedience training class where the dog's all over in one another's space, and it's really difficult for anybody to learn anything. The ideal length of lead is about 1.2 meters, which is about three feet, and that makes sure that the dog is around you, the lead is loose, it's comfortable for the dog, but they're not so far away that the dog's not really sure if he's supposed to be working now or not. The context that I'm referring to here for long leads is primarily in a dog training class. If you're taking your dog on a nice, relaxed, sniffy type of walk and you prefer for the dog to stay on lead but have lots of freedom and flexibility, a long line there is absolutely fine, but that's a seriously long line. There you're talking about 30 feet or 10 meters. The kind of long lead that I'm talking about here that causes trouble is the longer lead used in dog training classes. Leading on from the lead, that's really cheesy, I apologize, is the flexi lead. So this is the one where it's kind of a, 
an elasticized or a spring-loaded lead is rolled up into a plastic shell and as the dog moves out you can extend the lead and as the dog comes back you can uh, flick the, the switch to get the lead automatically rolled back into this plastic shell. These are really bad ideas because the dog is basically always being taught to pull on the lead. The only way the dog can get some distance or go forward and explore new areas is if he pulls on the flexi lead. Because there is that resistance, the dog, in the dog's mind, he's pulling his handler along all over the show. So we're basically training the dog that it's quite okay to drag your handler all over the show by your lead. Flexi leads also just get out of control really quickly. A dog lunges forward, the handler hasn't had a chance to put the brake on it. When they do put the brake on it, the dog comes to an abrupt end at the end of the lead which can obviously damage the dog it can hurt the handler as well they're just not really conducive to training good manners in your dog around other dogs or people the only time I would say a flexi lead would be a great idea is again if you're taking your dog out for a walk in a park but you're not comfortable to take their lead off their flexi lead would be okay but again it is reinforcing to the dog that in order for me to get from point A to point B I need to pull a much better option there again is the long line where the lead can actually trail on the floor so the dog's not getting that same resistance and the dog basically feels like he's off lead and that's how he's moving around. The double pup syndrome. A lot of people get two puppies at once thinking it's going to be great for the, for the pup to have the company of another pup and, and while I can certainly understand the sentiment in this and it's very kind of the, the owner to think about the pup's uh, needs for companionship during the day when they're possibly at work, this is really not a great way to raise either of those puppies. What tends to happen is these pups end up being so imprinted or so reliant on one another they literally see themselves as a unit. They don't see themselves as individuals as part of a social group. It's incredibly hard for these puppies to function in the world. What you will always find with these double pups and the double pup syndrome is one of the pups will be incredibly bold and adventurous and the other one will be a real ninny. And it's, I always joke about this, but it's quite true. If you took both those dogs, you added them together and you divided by two, you'd end up with a really balanced dog. But it almost seems like the pups find it to find a way to be on either ends of a lot of spectrums and it makes it incredibly difficult for the owner to manage these dogs effectively. A much better thing to do is to get one puppy, make sure that you are totally happy with this pup, how it's settled into your life, with its training, its socialization, etc, etc, and then get yourself another puppy. If you're worried about that first puppy being lonely during the day, there's more and more places now offering daycare services where your dog can go for the day, they have a lovely day with their friends, lovely day spending time with their carers. Let's put it in another way, would you allow a toddler to, to raise another toddler? Certainly not, but unfortunately that's what happens when we have two pups at the same time. An ideal age gap between two dogs in the same household would be about two years, but obviously this can alter depending on the particular environment and on the handler's experience level and support structure. Disney. The reason I say Disney is because a lot of people get their ideas on how dogs behave and what dogs are capable of doing by watching Disney movies and they have these unrealistic expectations when they come to training classes when they think oh well uh, I'm pretty sure everything will be fine if we just take the dog for training. Well yes and no. All training can do is maximize the, what the dog is capable of genetically. So what that means is if you get for yourself an outer Mongolian rabbit hunting terrier hound, but you also have pet rabbits, it doesn't mean you can take that dog to training and magically it's going to undo that dog's behavior at a, at a cellular level. This is so important and a lot of trainers get incredibly frustrated with this because the people arrive at training class, stars in their eyes, they're like, great, this is super, we're committed, but they're always going to be limited by the dog's genetics and what the dog is capable of doing. And it's unfair to the dog. You know, that's like me getting a bulldog and then getting really upset because the dog didn't make the National Agility World Champs team. That dog has got tremendous aptitude and skill, but not in that particular area. So you need to consider this when you get your dog. It's not just physical attributes that are particular to one breed, but it's also the mental attributes. And some breeds are just not suitable for some applications. Yes, there will always be the exception to the rule. And I think I'll add that on as, as, as a little subsection of what trainers hate. Someone will always tell you a story about the outer Mongolian rabbit hunting terrier hound that lived with baby rabbits. And yes, that does happen, but it's very, very rare. 
So what training can do is it can certainly help you maximize your dog's genetic potential, but it's impossible for training to push past those genetic caps. Don't get your information about animal behavior from Disney movies. They are not real. The Tooth Fairy is realer than a lot of the animal behavior information we get from Disney movies. And don't get me wrong, I love Disney movies, they're great, but these should not be a blueprint for how we perceive animal behavior. Then my personal favorite, and I really feel for these people, but I also get incredibly frustrated with them, and these are the people who want everything different with their dogs, but they're not prepared to change. It's an interesting behavioral paradigm that we move into because it's kind of like, but the situation as it currently stands is not acceptable to you, so therefore it stands to reason that we need to change some of those components to get a different outcome. I think maybe some people think that dog training is you bring your dog along and we take a USB cable and we plug it in the dog somewhere and we just kind of program it. Unfortunately, dogs are a lot smarter than that. They're not just these blank black boxes that we can program to, to operate any way we see fit. There's genetics, there's background, there's personal variation amongst every single individual dog that, that we know. So we need to consider that if you're having a particular problem with a dog in a particular situation, there's something in that situation that needs to change. And if the owner is not prepared to change whatever they can in that situation, it's unlikely that the behavior is going to improve. This is a really weenie one. It's actually in the grand scheme of things, not a huge big deal, but it, it does my head in on a regular basis, so I've included it here. We use positive reinforcement in training, which means we're gonna add something to increase the likelihood of behaviors occurring in the future. And normally what we add is either treats or toys. One of the key components of positive reinforcement training is the timing of our reward. It obviously needs to happen as, as, as close as possible to the behavior that it is that we want to increase in the future. If you don't have a treat bag and you're fumbling in a little plastic bag or a Tupperware container to get the treat to give it to the dog, you've lost your opportunity. As the dogs become more experienced, you can certainly start lengthening the time between marking of the correct behavior and the actual delivery of the reward. But in the early stages of training, it's so important to make sure that literally as soon as the puppy or the dog does the behavior that you like, they are rewarded for that. And for this, you need to make sure that your treats are easily accessible. So a treat bag that you can just clip onto your belt loop on your pants or tie around your waist is ideal for this. Another problem with treat bags on the flip side of this is that the treat bag is too obvious. It's this huge, really, really apparent indicator to the dog that there are rewards to be earned here. Yes, in the beginning, it might help to let the dog know this, but very, very quickly they progress in their training and they don't need to literally have the carrot in front of their nose. So the ideal treat bag is gonna be something that's easily accessible, but discreet. A superb solution here is to actually chuck the treat bag all together and just put the treats in your pocket. This obviously depends on what kind of treats you're using with your dog and the kind of treats I use with my dogs. I'm, I'm not too happy to put those in my pockets. I'd rather use a discreet treat bag. Another thing that does dog trainers heads in is people that are irresponsible when they use facilities with their dogs. Primarily, this means people not cleaning up after their dogs. I have zero sympathy for people with this because I have Great Danes. Just get into the habit of whenever you take your dog out, you take your treats, your treat bag, plastic bag, water for your dog, everything that you're gonna need, you should have on you. There's honestly no excuse for taking your dog somewhere, letting them enjoy the outing, enjoy the facilities, and your dog leaves a package on the ground and you walk away from it. There's just no excuse for that. And by all means, be the poop police. If you see someone else about to walk away from their dog's uh, toileting package, let them know about it. Let them know that you've seen and what you can even do, it's a little bit passive aggressive, but immediately go to them and say, oh, you must have forgotten your plastic bag. Yeah, would you like one? We all need to do our part on this. We're gonna lose more and more facilities and more wonderful areas to walk our dogs if people are not brought to book when they behave and act irresponsibly. The last thing on our list today is people who pay you for your expertise but decide to not listen to it. It's frustrating as a dog trainer because it kind of makes me feel like, but these people are wasting their money. Um, if they don't want to follow my advice and they don't want to do what I've said, that's 100% fine, I totally respect that, but then go somewhere else. I mean, it, it just seems odd to me that people would continue to spend money and invest time into something where they're not following the recommendation. And I guess 
What also falls into this category is people who shop around and they'll go to a bunch of different dog trainers until one gives them the opinion that they were wanting to hear. At the end of the day, no one's forcing anyone to go to a particular dog trainer. But I would, I would just advise, use your time and your money wisely and comply with what the trainer is suggesting. If you have any questions or any, any concerns about any of it, the vast majority of trainers will be more than happy to talk to you about it. But it just seems silly to me to, to ask and pay for advice and not to follow it. So that's the 10 things that dog trainers hate. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please remember to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hit the bell icon so you know whenever we have a new upload. Drop us a like on the video and also comment. Uh, give us your feedback on what you thought about this video. If you've enjoyed our videos, please share them with your friends and family. Uh, the more the merrier, as they say. And remember our goal is to get a new plant is to retire old, old dilapidated fern over there. I think, I think it, it needs to go out to pasture and I mean that in a, in, a, in a proper way, not go to pasture. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.